once again, this is my third time, uh, Delegate, Delegate Clarence Davis, and he's going to speak intensely about the intense experience that is the city of Baltimore, economically, uh, demographically, socially, and politically. And we are going to have Brendan uh, walking uh, through the crowd to take names for questions so that we can be more lickety split. And uh, once again, we're very honored uh, to present uh, Delegate Davis, Tiger Davis. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. It's, it's good to be back again. Uh, and once again, I want to welcome you to Baltimore. Baltimore, uh, you know, as I mentioned last night, I arrived in Baltimore uh, in 1948. My parents got here in 1947. And what we found when we got here was a city of communities, or a city of neighborhoods, okay? Uh, Italians lived over here, and you didn't cross that turf. <laughs> the Irish lived up in North Baltimore, uh, and, and you didn't cross a certain line. Uh, you had the Greeks who lived close to the Italians, uh, but the oftentimes they had their little conflicts as well. Okay, and so uh, you had what some folks would call the hillbilly communities as well. And everybody was like grouped into their own neighborhoods and you didn't cross uh, certain lines. And of course you had your African American community. And that's the one that I know best uh, because it was a very fluid and active community that was continually replenished by folks who were escaping. And that's a term we use, the hinterlands of the South. Okay. And what happened with those blacks when they arrived, they were denigrated by the blacks who were already here. And, you know, I, for a long time, I thought my first name was Dumb Country Boy. <laughs> because that's how they referred to you. And so we faced all, and believe me when I say this, this is the worst discrimination I've ever faced in my life was when I got here to Baltimore. Uh, I wanted to go back home to Georgia. I would rather have been behind Mr. John's mule, excuse my language, but sniffing Mr. John's mule parts as we stayed there the whole night. But my dad said, that's not for you, son. You know, you go get an education, because my dad only had second grade education. And of course, my mother had about seventh grade education, but she also was kind of like a teacher's aide uh, back home in, in Georgia. So. Uh, the blacks who came up from down south, they came north with a mission. And that mission was to make a better life for their children. And so, like my mother, you know, many of them worked two jobs. They cleaned folks' homes during the day, and they went to school at night. And so, you had a professional class coming out of that. Uh, for instance, the nurses or what have you. My mother, uh, was a nurse most of her life, but even though she was a nurse, she always worked two jobs. Okay, now, while we were growing up, uh, because you know you had that big urban migration, that meant that the black community was expanding after World War II. And as the black community was expanding, uh, that was the beginning of what you might call white flight. It was beginning at that particular time. It escalated once you had Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. But change was on the way, uh, a certain type of change. But let's talk about how that change began. You know, oftentimes when I'm speaking to groups, uh, especially black groups, I would say, well, look, you know, we've had, and I just mentioned this to one of them, we had two great leaders you know, that I always like to refer to. One was A. Philip Randolph, and of course, he would have been a Georgian uh, by nature, okay? And then you had uh, a Paul Robeson, uh, both of whose names have been practically written, you know, out of history. 
And the reason I use Paul, uh, I'm sorry, uh, A. Philip Brand's office because in 1941, he threatened a march on Washington if Franklin Delano Roosevelt didn't do something about the discrimination in the defense industry. Okay, and so uh, FDR would say, well, look, you know, there's a private enterprise, and, you know, government does not have any business uh, interfering with private enterprise. So he told Brandon, and I said, okay, fine. <laughs> We're going to march on Washington. We're going to bring 10,000 folks here uh, to D.C., and we're going to demonstrate. <coughs> Eleanor Roosevelt, being the lady that she was, impressed upon FDR that he needed to act. And so FDR then issued Executive Order 8802. And what 8802 did was it prohibited discrimination in the defense industry, which meant that this also encouraged uh, uh, more Southerners, or black Southerners, to come north because the steel industry had contracts with the federal government. You had all the defense industries in uh, Chicago or Detroit. In fact, uh, a great deal of my family moved to Detroit, and a lot of them moved to Cleveland because we were leaving the South, because there was opportunities there. But not only that, what you will remember most is that Executive Order 8802 also broke down the barriers in the military. You get to Tuskegee Airmen, okay, because Tuskegee Airmen, well, blacks were prohibited from being in the Army Air Force. Then you also get your first black Marines and they're called Montreal Point Marines today, okay, after Montreal Point, where they were trained. This is how all of this came about. Now, the military was resisting all the way, saying that we're not social engineers. We're not social engineers. But even if you look at today's world, how did you get some of the laws passed for the uh, LGBT community? They all start with the military, and why? Because the military is an authoritarian system, and when the, when the generals say this is it, then that's it. Everybody falls in line because you can control that. So the military was the ideal place to begin making change, despite the generals and, 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 and their view that we're not social engineers. Okay, so this works. So now we have uh, barriers broken. And so blacks are beginning to view or, or have opportunities uh, in areas that they have never, even though there's Bethlehem still in places like that. When I came along after Vietnam, we still were relegated to sweeping the floor. We could not become mechanics, we could not become electricians, none of that. Okay? And even whites who uh, uh, did not have the academic skills or the talents that we had. They got jobs as crane operators or whatever while we had to push that rope. Uh, you know, the, the coach, football players, Sherman Plunkett, Johnny Sappers and all of them. We worked with them during the summer because they couldn't even get decent jobs because, you know, football players didn't make that much money there. And so we would work along with them, pushing that room. <laughs> we had come home from a war uh, in the mid-60s, but what we found was that the uh, discrimination was being attacked uh, from all sides from the African-American community. They, but these people who broke down these barriers never get recognition for what they did. I walked into a situation at Bethlehem Steel where um, the black laborers there, you know, had come together. They called themselves the Minority Steel Workers for Equality. And they asked me to go to D.C. with them because they like taking young guys with them, right? And so uh, the leader of this group was a Marine who was in one of the bloodiest battles in the history of the Marine Corps, uh, the invasion of the Peleliu Islands, uh, you know, in the Pacific. And I looked at him, I said, well, Lee, 
What are you all fighting about, man? These are the best paying jobs. The black folks got in this country. He said, that's not good enough. We want equality. We want to be crane operators. We want to be electricians and all that. Now, this is my father's generation, right? And so I said, OK. So I go to DC with him, and we go to the Secretary of Works' office. And his assistant says, well, uh, the secretary is not in. And so Lee says, we'll wait. <laughs> but I don't think you understand he's not in the building. <laughs> we'll wait. But no, no, he, he, he will not be back today. We will wait. And so all of a sudden, the secretary ended up coming back. <laughs> now, here's what we found. And then I'm on a, a, a little piece here. Uh, because he, here, here's what was happening after World War II. Uh, and I like to read it. Uh, it says that we're talking about the new generation of blacks who fought in World War II. Uh, the young blacks after World War II were possessed with a new sense of self-respect, confidence, and determination to reject the humiliation of second-class citizenship. Well, this was a follow-up to that, okay, because they have been waging that war since World War II, okay, since Jackie Robinson and all of that. They had continued to wage that war. And so, uh, Lee Douglas, who was the premier leader of the Steel Workers, what you call it, he's about 95 years old now. Uh, he lives not that far from here, near Dunmore Hospital. Nobody knows who he is. But let me, let me tell you how important that was. You know, if you go into the room with all of these big gorillas or what have you, and you, you pick out the biggest one and you bust them in the lip, and everybody else will fall in line, right? <laughs> well, I tell the young people who ended up in 66, 67, 68, getting jobs with IBM, Xerox, and all of these other corporations, Prudential or whatever, you know, you owe that to Lee Douglas. Those little folks from the bottom who fought and broke down uh, uh, the barriers in the steel industry, because steel industry was the biggest thing going back at that time. But beyond that, the labor unions, uh, the United Steel Workers, the labor unions, were the strongest unions in this country. But here's what we found. And, 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 and this just does not apply only to blacks, because see, uh, whether you're Greek, uh, whether you're Italian, whether you're Irish, or whatever, there was always that pecking order, and somebody had to fight to break down those barriers. For instance, uh, Nancy Pelosi's father, Tom the Big Tommy, as we call him, he was one of my, uh, uh, you might call him a tutor, what have you, when I was about 15, 16 years of age. Uh, and Du Burns would take me around to those political events, uh, identifying me as a political science major from Morgan. Okay, that's how I got to know Fallon, Garmax, and all of these guys, right? Uh, because I had wanted to be a doctor at that particular time. And so what happened is, he would say to me, look, I know you have some concerns, but change is going to come. Change is going to come. When we Italians were young men, the Irish police, well, he said cops, but the Irish cops would catch us on the street, and then our Italian young fellas, take all of our clothing, and we would have to go home but maybe. And so, Every group that has come here has had to experience certain kinds of discrimination. The difference with blacks is, uh, it was a color thing whereby they were readily identified, and because they had come here slaves, they had to stay there. So when we uh, uh, attacked the, the unions, uh, what we found was that the unions were fighting to maintain the status quo. We were paying them union dues but they were maintaining the status quo. So when you look at, take that and move it to the housing, it was the same thing in housing in Baltimore City. Latrobe Projects was always white. Somerset and Douglas and East Baltimore were always black. And the two shall never meet. And in fact, if one group encountered another group, there would always be conflict. 
that is the Baltimore that I came to see uh, upon my route. And so what happened uh, after Brown versus Board of Education, things began to change. Whites began to move out. And as they moved out, blacks began to move into some of those neighborhoods. Now, of course, uh, there was also some economic improvements in their life for many folks, and, and that's why some of them moved out. But mostly it was white flight, okay? And so as the neighborhoods began to uh, uh, integrate, shall we say, uh, which was a natural thing given the circumstances, you run into situations where these communities that blacks were moving into uh, had been uh, one community, you know, the Germans lived here, and they had the Lutheran church here, so on and so forth. I moved into a neighborhood with St. Catharines where everybody was Catholic, okay? And so uh, this is when I found out the, uh, that the Catholic church was not what it was all about because the, the white guys that we made friends with in the community wanted us to play for their <coughs> baseball team, and I, we kept saying no. And they said, oh, come on, man, now, we work to play with you and your team. Why can't you come and play with us? Now, look, look, man, we don't want to do that. You know, uh, let's not go there and that kind of thing, right? And so we finally said, okay. So our newfound white friend go to their leadership at St. Catharines and ask to allow us on the, to play baseball with them. The next day, they, they ducked us. They didn't want to see us. The next time we saw them, I mean, talk about hurt. This was their first experience, you know, with discrimination. They were innocents. And so that's when I came to learn how uh, discrimination and, and racism or what have you affected other societies. Because I have never seen hurt in anyone like I was saw and, and the Schroeder and those other guys who uh, played for St. Catharines. So our communities continued to, uh, uh, the black community continued to expand and what was happening, like for instance, if you take Emerson Village. Emerson Village was one of the nicest neighborhoods, and it was a model neighborhood for the country after World War II. It was the model, you know, nice single family homes and all. But as white flight came about, uh, the, well, one in particular, uh, Goldseeker, okay, now there's a good side and a bad side, okay, because right, Goldseeker was a decent human being who always looked out for people. But what he did when he purchased those homes in El Edmondson Village, he took single family dwelling units, turned the basement into one apartment, first floor in one part and then the second floor. And so what you get is uh, community institutions or facilities like the high schools being, or, or the elementary schools being overcrowded. And then the quality of those schools began to tumble. Now goal second, uh, I went to, I attended, uh, secured my master's degree on a goal second fellowship, right, and <laughs> pursued my doctoral studies. That's who goes second world, but some folks like to look at him at what they call a black tax. But he was much more than that. And some of the old black social workers would tell you, well, you know, um, uh, whenever I needed uh, housing uh, for my clients, there was only one person I could go to, and that was gold second. But now we're in the 60s, and that, in the late 60s, and they're calling it a black tax. Okay, because that entire community went down here. But I, I, when I look back, that was a natural progression uh, because everybody was uh, uh, taking economic advantage over new arrivals in various neighborhoods or what have you. And that was life as I saw it growing up in Baltimore. But there are some things that I think you need to also see or uh, we'll take a look at. After World War II, look at the change that occurred in America. That same change was occurring here in Baltimore City. Uh, for example, 1947, Jackie Robinson crosses the color line, right? 
in baseball. 1948, Harry Truman issues Executive Order 9981. What that order did was effectively desegregated the United States military. But as General Beckton, he was a young lieutenant then, would say, he's still alive over DC, he would say, look, uh, when Truman issued that executive order, the commander called us all together and he said, as long as I'm commander, there will be a cause for the whole, there will be a wife for the whole. These damn politicians come and go every four years, but the military, we're an institution, we're here forever. You know, and so nothing happened in the United States military to break down those barriers. But then when war breaks out in 1950 in Korea, the United States got caught unprepared. So they took the 24th Infantry, you know, one old Buffalo Soldiers unit that was doing police work in Japan, threw them in front of the oncoming uh, 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 North Koreans or what have you. Many, they suffered many casualties or what have you. Uh, but at any rate, it became too cumbersome to determine who was black and who was white or what unit is black. So they said, well, look, we're just going to sign people by the job description. That's how the military integrated. It was an economic thing uh, because it was too cumbersome to do otherwise. Well, the fathers who fought together, returned home. The military was effectively integrated. The last unit was integrated in 1955. The war was over in 1953. Now the impact of the military, what happened there, was in 1954, May 17th, you get Brown versus Board of Education. That's because of what happened in the military. Well, there were some things going on back here as well. It was about that time that the experiment with integration started in Baltimore. It started before 1954. Polytechnic High School and City College were the premier uh, institutions uh, for males. Uh, they had all had what was called an A course or whatever. So they took six flats, put them into poly. Uh, I knew a few of them, because I went to school with their younger brothers and sisters. And then Dr. Gill's son graduated from the city in 57. They were all part of the experiment. They saw this coming. And so in Baltimore, despite all the segregation and everything, the leadership, and when I say leadership, I'm talking about Tommy Delisandro, Pelosi's father. And also, the governor, who was Thomas, who was Theodore R. McKelvin, uh, a good Republican. Okay, unlike he was a Rockefeller type Republican, that's the only way we describe it, right? <laughs> but at any rate, they saw it coming, and they were beginning to make moves to initiate change without a lot of fanfare. And so by the time. Uh, 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 1954, I had a choice. I chose to go to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School or junior senior high school. My sister, two years later, she chose to go to integrate about. And so, uh, you know, we view the world differently now, okay, because she went that route, ended up never paying a penny to go to school. She got a double MBA for breakfast, the whole works, right? So we see things somewhat differently. But the bottom line is that Baltimore, uh, despite the segregation that continues to exist. In fact, we are more segregated now uh, than we were back then. Nothing has changed along that line. And the reason nothing has changed is because all we did in many areas, like I said last night, was we changed from white to black. But the institution itself never changed. And so uh, in Baltimore, right now, with the city being nearly 70% black, we have a chance to be an example for the nation in many areas. And this is what I was talking to young Andy about yesterday, because the city does not have the resources. But George offers us an opportunity. And this is something that we must look at, because we have to be about change. 
So I'm going to end with that. And if there are any questions, I don't know whether we have a question and answer period. I'll try to tighten up some things that we question and answer period. Good morning, Rick Ryback with Just Economics. Thank you for giving us such a uh, rich uh, feeling for the richness and complexities of Baltimore's history. As you know, the people in this room are looking at uh, tax reform as a way to create more fairness and justice and at the same time create better and greater economic opportunities for many, both workers and businesses. And yet, if you look at the history of many cities, a lot of people have made a lot of money off of land speculation. And I'm wondering if we were to propose this in Baltimore, if there wouldn't be a response along these lines. Well, when Baltimore was white, it was okay for us to make money off of land. But now that we're beginning to become landowners, meaning we uh, African Americans, now you want to remove that wealth building opportunity, and that's so unfair. What kind of response should we give in a situation like that? Well, uh, that, that's, that's a toughie there, okay? Because you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Okay, but that's normally what happens. Uh, now, what we have right now, currently, and, you know, I'm contacted almost every other week by speculators out of D.C. These are black speculators out of D.C. because I'm chairman of the Baltimore City Veterans Commission. And all of a sudden, everybody who wants to uh, provide affordable housing for veterans, so they come to me. And they say, well, look, you know, we can do this, and we don't need no financing and all. We've got our own finance. I mean, you know, they're coming from everywhere. So to those people, if we change our taxation uh, our structure, they're going to grant. But I think the masses of people, the people like Nia, whom you spoke to, uh, the masses of people, once they receive information and understand what it's about, uh, they will not object. And so those persons who have that economic interest solely in mind, because really they don't care about the quality of life for the people in the city, they're talking, they, they want to make money. And so what we have to do is to paint that picture quality of life or individual economic opportunity. And once we paint that, uh, and it's about truth and getting our community to seek the truth. But yes, that's what they do. That's what happens. Yeah. Josh, thing is that Vincent? Yep. Oh, and I've been guilty of that too. That's why I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I have the, the next question, and it's a pretty, pretty serious one. What is the atmosphere? and the relationship between the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland, including the executive and legislative branches. I, as an outsider, I know it's fraught, uh, but what is the future? We have an election this year for, for governor, but what, what is the future and how does that help or, or hinder our effort to assist the city? Uh, you know, I think it's an opportunity uh, and, you know, as I was talking to young Andy yesterday, I said, look, now, you all are young, young folks who are seeking to be involved politically. You've got to bring something different. Now, let me give you my experiences, and, and, and I want you to do all to come up with new ideas, because if you come out hashing and rehashing the same old thing over and over, we're going to end up with the same thing that we got now. And so this is why I'm bringing the young folks on. Okay, but uh, the city of Baltimore is viewed as being on welfare to the state. And therefore, we're treated as such. 
You know, in order for us to get an extra dollar uh, of funding to develop our children in the city, educational, what have you, Montgomery County and Howard County is going to demand something else. It's, it's like, uh, like with higher education, the same thing. You know, uh, the courts have said that because of this discrimination or what have you, uh, the state must provide enhancement money for the HBCUs or the historically black colleges and universities. They may give us a dollar and call it enhancement, but on the other end, they increase University of Maryland twofold over here. And so we keep going around and around in the circle and nothing ever happens. Now, uh, I could talk about the destruction of black institutions. I mean, how many, you, you've heard of UMBC, they had a good run in the uh, NCAA basketball, right? Mm -hmm. And Towson. <coughs> when I was a student at Morgan, Towson had maybe 300 students. Okay. Now they have, what, about 15, 20,000. When I was a student at Morgan, UMBC did not exist. They started in 1966. They built those two institutions up, UMBC from the ground, and, and Towson didn't even have certification. It was a little teacher's college. They were not a liberalized college. They put all that money into those two institutions and did not give Morgan a dime. And I think it was 1970, students from Morgan went down to take over the state house. But this is how things work in this particular city. And uh, I'm sorry, not only in the city, but in the state. And what happened is they began to duplicate programs that Morgan had. And that meant that students would then go to UMBC or, 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 or Towson. Now, the irony of all of this is that Morgan was probably, and, and most of your black institutions were probably the most integrated schools in this nation. You know, uh, our graduate school was more than 50% white. You know, and we were a black school. Our student body population was probably well above 10% white. Okay, and this was a black institution. Everybody got along well, and they worked well together. You look at Howard University. Their dental school was more than 50% uh, white. And so what happened is the funding here in the state of Maryland went to those two institutions while Morgan was relegated uh, for destruction. And now, the other thing is there was no school in Maryland, and especially the University of Maryland, that could compare with the academic qualities of Morgan State College at that time. You look at the number of PhDs. Uh, we had specialists in every area, but they were relegated to a black institution. Uh, no school, I mean, we had probably had at least 25% more PhDs on our faculty than the University of Maryland. In fact, uh, University of Maryland compared to Morgan at the time was a garbage institution. Uh, <laughs> because, look, Morgan was it. It was the flagship. Okay. But funding, and that comes from the state. But now understand this. Uh, when I, we only had about three or four blacks out of 141 in the House of Delegates. <coughs> and maybe one in the state senate. So we had no voice in government. And so whenever we got the crumbs falling off the table, they expect us to bow down and say, thank you, Jesus. And that we would not do, because I came from a different generation. Just like I mentioned earlier about that generation from World War II, you know, they refused to uh, accept the humiliation of second-class citizenship. Well, we are their children, and we refuse to accept the crumbs that were falling off the table. Now, oftentimes, we may have gone about it, um, in ways that, well, we could have chose better ways to come back at, okay? Let me put it that way. We're a little older now. When we look back, we know we could have done it differently. But we were afforded the kind of education 
where we discuss things like Henry George. Uh, we discuss things like the China entanglement. Uh, and, and we were uh, ardent students of enlightenment. Okay, and, and, and we could go out and say to anyone that, look, America is an experiment in democracy. These are the philosophers and the people who laid the foundation that Thomas Jefferson and others followed. Okay, and we can make the case, you know, for America, but at the same time, when we criticize America, we all ended up on the COINTELPRO list, right? And so, so we were considered persona non grata with the government. And many of us were veterans who had returned home. I could talk about Geronimo Pratt. I could talk about Eddie Conway and all these guys who went to jail for crimes they did not commit, OK? Uh, simply because the government wanted to get us off the street. I can tell you about the bombing that this government initiated against us. But despite all of that, we still believe that America is the hope for the world. But America can only be a hope for the world if we generate new ideas of how to move America towards a more perfect union. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here, because I believe that Georgian uh, uh, theories can help move <laughs> America forward. Because what are we going to do in this city? <coughs> How long is it going to take us to bring whites back into the city where we have uh, an income or a tax base whereby we can begin to do some things? And if we move them back in the city, what are we going to do with the current residents? We're, we're giving all of them Section 8 to move them out, out of the city, correct? Yeah. Move them out of the city to the council. So we're shifting the problem around. Or whatever. Hey, we need to dig in, come up with new ideas, and once again, this idea of Georgian uh, theory uh, should be known to all of our young people growing up. We've got to get back to teaching uh, about the Knights of Labor. Yeah. yeah, we got to talk about the Knights of Labor. But now, there is a group, and I've been watching them, the SEIU Union, right? Yeah, yeah. SEIU. They tend to. Uh, 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 lean toward Georgian philosophy and theory. And so uh, I was talking, I said, I said, well, you know, if we make this move as veterans, we need to find partners. And I know those folks over there. OK, we, we need to sit down and talk to them about partnerships. And maybe we need to kind of see if we can pull together a conference and, 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 and Rick, you know, have you and uh, Josh and all come in and let's talk about Georgian theory. And we can invoke, we got the people to invoke, but we can invoke W.B. Du Bois. And they're going to love that now, right? Because they got to come at it from their perspective a little bit. Most of them don't even know who Terrence Powerly uh, <laughs> is, okay? But uh, we, we have to educate them uh, in the process. Now, when I grew up, uh, my dad was a teamster. I thought the teamsters were the greatest thing that I had ever seen. I would read it in the papers. If I sold newspapers, right? Uh, when I was a young kid, 50, 52 to maybe 53 or whatever, Dave Beck was always in the paper, or somebody was always invited, investigating him. But I didn't care. I didn't care. Because I knew the teams was up close and personal, and I had that personal relationship with them because what they did, they used to, the, the, the teams used to involve the families in all of their activities, and they would have these uh, bull ropes or what have you, where they, they brought all the families together. And so here, it didn't matter whether you was black, white, Greek, or, or whatever, you know, you were a teamster. And then when Jimmy Hoffa took over, and they began to not, I did not care. Because I identified with the Teamsters and what they were trying to do. And then when I came home from the military, hey, and the front of the Civil Rights Movement was uh, 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 all of the labor leaders throughout this country, Ruth, all of them, 
were out front. Luiso, Paolo Luiso was killed down in Alabama. The labor unions were provided. And now at the same time now, I'm with Lee Douglas, and we're fighting the United States steel workers because they are protecting the status quo, you know, at Bethlehem Steel. And so uh, I've always been a child of labor, but somewhere along the line, labor <laughs> lost its mission. They lost a sense of mission because labor began to become more capitalist than anything else. And so uh, the interest of labor's, uh, what they call investment funds or what have you, was tied up in Wall Street. And so for me, that was a contradiction. And so, so what we have to do is to work right here at the grassroots level. I can't do nothing about that. But here, I can call up Ricardo Jones and say, hey, Ricardo, look, I need to get the top people in your labor union. We need to sit down and talk about our city and what we're going to do about bringing revenues to our city, okay? Because we're not going to be able to move, uh, you know, whites with huge incomes back in the city. I don't care what we build down in the office. We're not going to be able to get them back here in time to have an impact on my grandchildren. So we need something that's going to be lasting. This is it. We'll take Ed, Ed, and then Alan, yeah, and then, okay. uh, Mr. Davis, uh, you talked a little bit with uh, what uh, Rick's question about um, what I would say is sort of a gentrification by absentee property buyers. Right. What about you know bringing back black professionals, high-income people, to come back to the neighborhoods to create that economic diversity? Is there no way to make Baltimore's neighborhoods appealing to those blacks who have made it and have some personal association and love for the city? And I, and I bring that up only because I'm in Philadelphia, and the one person who's done most in Philadelphia is Kenny Gamble to do that. You know who Kenny Gamble is? I know the name. Okay. And if you want to talk to someone, give you some ideas of what would work in Baltimore, the way it's worked in Philadelphia, it's Dr. Kenny Gamble. Okay. Uh, I will keep that in mind as I move forward. Uh, but once again, how do you get people to move back into uh, a city that's uh, identified as one of the most violent places in these United States where little girls are getting shot down? Uh, and the bullying that goes on in the city. Uh, we as black veterans, uh, we believe that um, it is our mission to retrieve <laughs> those young people from the clutches of decadence. But here's what happened. 1995, we came together and said, hey, this got to stop. So we went around knocking on drug dealers' doors and we call them out and say, hey, look, if we can't live in peace, then neither would you. So please call us on the carpet. Accuse us of vigilantism. I tell the major, I say, look, these are nephews, these are cousins. Uh, we've known these kids all their life. We were there when they were born. You know, we're not going at them because we dislike them. We're going at them because we love them. And so, tried to make our case on the way out the door. And he's black too. The major said, consider yourself as having been born. Now I go back, and because he, we always had at least 100 vets out there. I go back and I talk to them, and they say, well, I'll go Tiger. You know, we with you. But it's one thing to deal with these little crazies who were born as drug babies and stuff like this and have to look over our shoulder for them, but we cannot look over our shoulders at police because we know the police force is corrupt. They're the ones who are making the real money off the drug trade. They're the ones who got the kids out there selling it. They're the ones who protect certain kids and all of that. And all of it is coming to light right now. And we knew in 
in our community, that some of those kids that were shot in the back of the head, we knew that they were police officers who was killing those kids because if they got too close to them, they was going to knock them off. Now, that is what's been going on in the city for 25 to 30 years or more. So how do you deal with that? We can't pick up arms. But we stay together. And we continue to hope and we continue to fight. Because what happened is, we had these 12 kids down at St. Francis who were homeless kids <laughs> we were working with, our black vet group. And the dental services for one of our vets found out about it. They took all the kids out there, gave them all dental care, set up appointments for them, and gave them free dental care all the way through. Those people out there who will help if we take the initiative. What happens is we sit around and talk about why things can't be done as opposed to getting out and doing something. This is why, Josh, Josh I told young Andy yesterday, hey, we're going to do this. You know, we're not going to look at all the impediments or the roadblocks of what happened. We're going to step out and take the initiative. Let me end that at that point because I think that was another question. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, uh, the pioneers have talked about, uh, I, I see that you're a, a coalition builder, and I appreciate that about you. But the pioneers say that the way forward is to create uh, coalitions, and they talk particularly about creating a coalition with the environmentalists, <coughs> and the NAACP. Um, you talked about SEIU, which is great. Uh, what, how, how do we uh, bring in the, the NAACP? Or are they the right people to do the coalition? I think Joss has done a great thing bringing you here. But how do we uh, build coalitions? Well, uh, first of all, you got to make sure you know who you're picking to be your partner. Okay. Uh, because oftentimes, if they, they, you know, everything's about self-interest. And the NAACP is on the ropes, okay? We are not on the ropes, and we don't really need anyone because we, uh, you know, we, we're used to receiving missions and carrying out missions. We know how to adapt, and these are the things that we talk about. And we believe that it is up to us because we're the only ones who have the discipline to try to bring our kids back in line. When I came up at Coach Edgar Lee Bell, the Battle of the Bulge, World War II, Mac Lewis, the great boxing coach, he had a couple champs. Uh, he, he never took a penny from any of them. They came home from World War II and set up initiatives for the kids in the neighborhood. All of them did. Some of those former. Negro Baseball League players in, 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 uh, in uh, West Baltimore set up teams and stuff because we all wanted to be Jackie Robinson there. And so the leadership or, or those soldiers from World War II came home without any money, used their own money, and, and, and they built us into strong young men. Young men who would grow up, go to college, and take on the system and at the same time fight the war an unpopular war in Vietnam, and still come home and endure Cointel from. So, I mean, you know, be careful, because every group has their own self-interest. We have no self-interest other than the liberation of our community. I am uh, Jung Freikotter from the Netherlands. Okay. okay. Uh, and my question is, in, in general terms, uh, how does private ownership in land contribute to racial segregation? How does private ownership contribute to uh, segregation or the continuation of segregation? That's right. Well, it depends upon who that private ownership is and what their mission is. Um, let me give you an example. Clearly, Oprah Winfrey is private enterprise, right? I mean specifically ownership of land. Okay, ownership of land. Well, now that's a horse with a different color now that you mentioned land, the source of all wealth, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, once again, that's going to depend upon the individual. Okay, now we instituted black studies to deal with questions like yours. 
uh, back in the late 60s because uh, you know people say, well, well, well what's this black studies? Uh, uh, black studies is not going to make you a medical doctor. I said, yeah, but look, if in these general education requirements, we institute black studies. Then when you become a doctor, you're going to understand that your mission is to provide quality health care for your community. And that's going to be your mission because it's all about what? Our development of the mind and one's vision of the world. Currently, if we deal with the vision that most folks have, uh, those architects and engineers will not come out to build great communities for the people. They will try to build communities that they can make money off of. Okay, and, and, and that is the difference. But we had hoped that with the black studies, we could uh, redevelop people's thinking. Okay, because what you have here, if you're talking about blacks, there's no difference between the way blacks think and white thinks when they're seeking money or seeking wealth. They all think the same way. Uh, that's in my very good friend, uh, Reginald F. Lewis, who purchased, you know, did that leverage file on Beatrice Foods, right? For what? I think it was $985 million. You know, Reggie would say, why should white boys have all the fun? So he's going to do it the same way that they did. Me, I'm me. Do it the same way, uh, but I might act differently. And in fact, I think Reggie may have acted differently too, because the first thing that he did, he, you know, he gave Harvard, what, $3 million, I think it was, right? And they named the school out there. Now, the black dudes would say to me, hey, man, he got all that money. Why he getting that money to the white school? They don't need to be there. Nah, Reggie had a vision of keeping that school open for others to follow him. And that's why he gave two million to the NAACP. He, he gave, helped finance Jesse Jackson's campaign. I mean, look, he was putting money out there. Okay, so I think Reggie's head was in the right place uh, as a capitalist, but he didn't live long enough. And of course, then you get the conspiracy theories. Well, you know, they killed him. They they injected him with some kind of cancer. You know, I mean, you know that kind of stuff. Oh, they use radiation because you know in the black community you always get these uh, 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 theories uh, <laughs> about why things happen. Okay, because it's always somebody else's fault that these things happen. So these conspiracy theories always abound in the community. But the bottom line is. What we said back in the late 60s and the early 70s, when we talked about Ujamaa villages and all, yes, we're going to build a strong economic base, but it's going to be owned collectively. And that's the term we use, collectively. Because, you know, uh, we, we had looked at building housing that would be owned by the people, uh, whether in a collective or otherwise. These, this was our direction. Uh, when we were coming out of school in the late 60s and early 70s, but somehow all of that has dissipated at this particular point. But capitalism is something that we have to consider. But for black folks, we have to look at it somewhat differently because the banks will never lend us money, so we don't have access to capital. You know, and so uh, if we were to pursue some kind of economic endeavor, we would be up to here, and we would not have enough operational monies uh, to handle it, because that's the way the banks deal with us. But it could be different if we had some real change here in the city, because look at all the people who get rich off the city. Like I tell kids, I say, look, you're an engineer, go into the military. They're going to make you get a master's degree. But before you come out, get your construction company together so that you see all these folks uh, paving these streets now, then that can be your job. We don't even have, I mean, look, go learn bridge building. We have no blacks building bridges in this country. You know, but somehow what we have now at the black institutions is a white educational system. Once we had a black educational system, because it was just like Howard University. 
when Charles Hamilton in Houston uh, was asked by Mordecai Johnson, who was the first black president of Howard University in 1926, he said, look, I need you to build a law school based on constitutional law because that is how we're going to attack this problem that we face as a people. It was gold or that's what black institutions did. Okay, and, and, and we have to get back to that. Okay, because it is clear that uh, we cannot function in a capitalist society trying to bring communities along uh, on a welfare system. Okay, uh, that, that's the only way I can put it. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Polly Cleveland. I'm from, hey, Polly. I'm from New York City, and which is overall the richest city in the country. But to raise taxes, change tax policies, change assessment policy, change, improve our transportation, just about anything, we have to go to Albany for permission. Uh, so. I think you have something of a similar problem, but I'd like to hear about it. How does uh, Annapolis shackle you from taxing your own very rich tax base, it is, or otherwise progressing? What are, what are the constraints and what can be done about them? Well, the biggest constraint is going to be the lobbyists who pay for the politicians. That's the biggest constraint, right? But first, we have to saturate the community with knowledge and understanding of what it is we're trying to do. And that may take two years. Whatever it takes, we must commit ourselves to that journey. And once we do that, uh, and we're prepared, and our, we have unity among our elected leaders in the city, then we can go uh, to Annapolis. But we still will have to do some work with Montgomery County and some of the other subdivisions as well. Uh, but one of the things is that we can show them how we can stand on our own because they're always complaining about uh, Howard County and Montgomery County that, that the city is on welfare to them, right? Well, we want to get off welfare, you know. Uh, and see, we have a, we only, we're we only talking about 600 and maybe 40,000 people. Where in New York, you're talking about what, 8, 9, 10, 12 million. So, so. Uh, uh, we can uh, be a city uh, that can do uh, where a demonstration project uh, can be developed and work. And, and of course, if we can kick it off and get started, I know we have the support of Josh and others who will come in and help give guidance to that. Okay, uh, but we once again we have to couch it within. Uh, the proper, uh, let's say, cultural surroundings. <laughs> like once again, we got to invoke Du Bois, right? <laughs> and we got to invoke Ethel of Randolph, okay? Uh, because uh, we don't want it to be seen as that white thing. Because that's the first thing they're going to start saying, oh man, that's that white thing, you know, what have you. And that always gets blacks screwed up. Because they, they're always, despite the fact that they say they want to end racism, they are a victim of racism, and everything that comes out is based upon race. Let me give you an example of what I mean. The Confederate flag, the Confederate monuments, our leadership would say they must come down because they represent hatred, racism, and all that other stuff. Now, the reason they come down is because they're symbols of rebellion against this country that tried to destroy everything this nation was about. That is why they need to come down. We in the Black Veterans Movement, we view things through a different prism than our leadership. Okay? And so we are the right ones to do this because we believe that part of our mission is to move America beyond race, okay? Because once we embrace what America is all about, that's some of the things I want to talk about on Thursday night. Once we embrace the enlightenment thinkers, once we embrace 
the mission, what America is really about, where America is going, that is our shield against the Donald Trumps, the uh, KKK, the Nazis, and all these other groups. We must advance the vision of America. And that's what we have to do as blacks. And we don't care if they say, well, you're sucking up, man. you Uncle Tom. No. And you know they're going to do that. But that is our strength, and we need to play to that particular strength, which is America's strength. Uh, David, the last question. Comment and question. I'm being from Chicago. We have a little problem with, with the violence. And you oh, are a slight a problem. problem. Slight. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're a so-called with, with the veterans is something that I have thought of with respect to Chicago. Why don't some why are some veterans not getting together to well now let's say don't use the term vigilantes. We, we weren't vigilantes. Well, you, I said so called that you were accused of <laughs> Yeah we were accused of that. Okay, all right, go ahead. But that's just my comment. It, it's something I, I have been thinking about too. And my my question was also so much of the violence and so much of the social disorder has to do with drugs, but not only drug use, but drug prohibition. What's your position on drug prohibition? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I grew up smoking tie sticks. Because in Southeast Asia, the Golden Triangle, we had the best herb in the world, right? <laughs> so, so I understand that. Okay. But there's other stuff, you know, in your veins and up your nose and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's something new, but I have seen my children's generation saturated with that. Uh, I believe that it needs to be decriminalized, all right, straight across the board, okay? And, I'm, and we need to find some ways of treating that. Uh, we need the counselors and the therapists to work with our kids, but we also need the counselors and the therapists to work with uh, our total community, okay? so. Uh, that's kind of how I view that, because I don't know how anyone uh, can achieve anything messed up on cocaine or heroin, okay? And what we want is for all of our young people to be productive. We know better than that, okay? So we have to try to um, eradicate that. We have some ideas about it uh, that we're not talking about at this particular time. But the first thing we have to do is to deal with uh, treatment on one hand, and then we have to lock up all those bankers who are wrongly <laughs> drug money. Okay, that's what we got to do. All of and, and the thing is, there are reports that have come out of Congress, and you can order them on money laundering, but all of these banks, and I mean the major banks, city, all of them have been engaged in money laundering. So awesome. the whole nation is pushing drugs. The other thing that we have to look at too is when there are no wars where those stockpiled guns can be distributed in, they then are distributed where? On our streets. And you always have those operatives like uh, what is it, uh, uh, what was it, American Airlines, American Group, and America, yeah, that's dealing them drugs, okay? We all knew what was going on. The government turned its way. Afghanistan. I've got soldiers who can tell you right now that uh, those captains and majors went over there with suitcases full of $100 bills. When the Taliban was in charge, drugs was a no-no because they killed drug dealers immediately, okay? But once the United States come in, all of a sudden, drugs began to flow again. So we need to talk about how do we get to the bottom of this because there's no way we cannot destroy those fields, co cocaine, coca fields in South America. The government supposedly are with us, right? The government said. Now, these things happen because the people in power want them to happen because they, it's all about money, 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 money. Okay, look, look, I want you to do something. I want you to write this down. Uh, 
I want you to write down Gavin, G-A-V-I-N, Eugene Long. I want you to pull up his suicide note. Okay? No, no, L-O-N-G. L-O-N-G. I want you to pull up his suicide note. All right. You remember the, the five cops that was killed in Dallas, right? By the young veteran, right? This was their response to what needs to be done to stop the violence by police against the African American community. We say they are misguided. When you look at that suicide note of Gavin Eugene Long, he makes all the sense in the world, but his mythology, he's wrong. Because what he says is that, look, all of this crime, praying, and marching ain't going to do nothing to stop this 150 years of terrorism that our community has faced. The only thing they understand is money and violence. They ain't got no money, but I'm going to give them plenty of violence. And when you look at the videos of him out stalking the cops, he killed three cops in, in, in Baton Rouge, and I think he probably put about three or four others in the hospital. We've got to reach those kids who are coming home from war before they engage in that kind of behavior. I know what was going through our heads when I came home. My first day home, I was locked up and beaten by the police. Okay. Uh, the younger warriors, they're different. And one of the things I brought up at our black vet meeting this weekend, look, there are young black soldiers coming home and committing suicide in more ways than just sitting around overdosing or blowing their brains out. Some are engaged in police across this country, but if you notice when that thing happened in Dallas, it was in the newspapers one day, and then the next day it was gone, right? It was completely shut down. What they had done, the government, the ATF, the federal government, gave them a robot to take a bomb to the shooter, right? You had to kill five cops. And then they detonated the bomb. This way, hey, there's no trial, there's no discussion in the conversation. This kid here left behind a suicide note where he talks about good cops and bad cops and stuff like this. I said, dang, this kid making a whole lot of sense here. But read his suicide note. But somehow, and I don't know, I, I, I told them at this thing this weekend, we've got to find a way to do more outreach where we can identify these kids and bring them in. We need people to work on the streets in the community with these kids. Better off the way. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end on that. But remember, the world depends upon whose eyes you're viewing the world through. All history is current events. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Davis. And uh, we're, back on, uh, we're back on Thursday night, and there's two questions I want to, to answer. Could you talk about your sisters, uh, the women? Um, I hear a lot of uh, talk about men, but what does it mean for the women in your community, but also in, in Georgism? And you must explain why you call it the tiger. All right. I love it. I love to talk about our bosses in the community. 